Hello everyone, this is Jan Chromi and together we will continue the course Interdisciplinary Approaches to Language and its Use. In this presentation we will continue our discussion of discourse processing. Historically, very influential approach to discourse comprehension was the so-called schema theory. In 1980, David Trummelhardt understood schemata as the building blocks of cognition. He defined them as knowledge representations which we form for all concepts such as objects, situations, events, sources of events, actions and sequences of actions. According to this approach, schemata have variables, they can embed one within another and they represent knowledge at all levels of abstraction. A classic example of a schema would be the restaurant script. We all have the knowledge of how to behave in a restaurant. When we enter, we may expect to be seated, we expect the waiter to come and bring the menus. The waiter may ask us whether we would like something to drink, then we order drinks and the waiter leaves. The waiter comes again, probably already with the drinks, and he or she asks us what we would like to eat and so on. This has consequences both for our behavior in general and for our linguistic behavior. For various reasons, however, is the schema theory typically considered as an obsolete approach, at least in the discourse comprehension studies. Currently, discourse comprehension is rather explained using other approaches such as mental simulations or situation models. Nevertheless, it is clear that our previous knowledge may influence how we process the given discourse. A famous study in the field of discourse comprehension was published by John Bransford and Marshall Johnson, who examined the role of the background knowledge for the processing of a text passage. In their experiment, they presented participants a text passage, either with a title or without a title, and measured the comprehension and recall of the information. The authors assumed the title might point us to a specific background knowledge, which then helps us with the processing. The text passage was as follows. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups depending on their makeup. Of course, one pile may be sufficient depending on how much there is to do. If you, if you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, that is the next step. Otherwise, you are pretty well set. It is important not to overdo any particular endeavor. That is, it is better to do few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications from doing too many can easily arise. A mistake can be expensive as well. The manipulation of the appropriate mechanisms should be self-explanatory, and we need not dwell on it here. At first, the whole procedure will seem complicated. Soon, however, it will become just another facet of life. It is difficult to foresee any end to the necessity for this task in the immediate future, but then one never can tell. I assume it seems quite hard for you to process the text. Now try it with the title. Bransford and Johnson found that readers who had the title evaluated the text passage as more comprehensible and also they recalled the text better. This finding is an evidence of the important role of background knowledge in discourse processing. Another interesting question is how and when the language comprehension system relates an incoming word to semantic representations of the wider discourse and of the unfolding sentence. Jos van Berkum and his colleagues did an electroencephalography study, which examined the integration of discourse coherent and discourse anomalous words. The whole experiment was in Dutch, but I will present the English translation here. Participants listened to short stories such as As agreed upon, Jane was to wake her sister and her brother at five o'clock in the morning. But the sister had already washed herself and the brother had even got dressed. The last sentence in the story contained either a word which was semantically anomalous, given the previous context, or not. An example of this course co coherent ending is the sentence Jane told the brother that he was exceptionally fast. 
The example of discourse anomalous ending is the sentence Jane told the brother that he was exceptionally slow. Importantly, these sentences are perfectly fine when presented in isolation. The only reason why to think these sentences would be processed differently is the previous discourse. Importantly, the discourse anomalous endings, such as slow in this example, elicited a large N400 effect. N400 is an event-related potentials component, which is related to semantic processing. A larger N400 effect is typical for semantically anomalous or semantically unexpected words. These findings thus, thus suggest that every incoming word is immediately related to the wider discourse, not only to the sentential level. A relatively recent view of text comprehension is called RIVEL view, which stands for Resonance Integration and Validation. It has been proposed by Ann Cook and Edward O'Brien. This view assumes that text comprehension consists of three sub-processes. Resonance is an automatic memory retrieval mechanism, which is initiated when we encounter new information during text comprehension. During resonance, related information in memory is being activated. Integration refers to the process during which the activated information is integrated with the evolving discourse model. And validation is the process by which the integrated information is assessed against both the real-world knowledge and earlier narrative. Activation, integration and validation are operating in parallel but the onset of these processes is asynchronous, with resonance beginning first and validation last. All three processes are passive and readers cannot consciously control them. Before we will conclude this presentation, I have one reading tip for you. If you are interested in neural aspects of discourse comprehension, you may read an interesting and introductory review article, The Electrophysiology of Discourse and Conversation, in the Cambridge Handbook of Psycholinguistics, which was written by Jos van Berkum. If you enjoyed the presentations, we would be glad if you would like them on YouTube. That is all from me now. See you next time.